Well, Mark, here we are for our September get-together, questions posed by the fans. And we'll be discussing today the Berry situation, yeah. the fixture situation, I follow, fast food inside Fratton Park, and perhaps surprisingly at this stage of the season, Kenny Jacket. OK, let's start with Berry. You must be extremely sad to see what's happened there. But from a Pompey fan's angle, will season ticket holders be getting some money back due to that situation? Yeah, I mean, I'm sad when any club gets into financial difficulties, whether that be Berry, Bolton, you know, anyone in League Two, League One, Champ, even the Prem, you just don't like to see other clubs because you know yourself what the fans are actually going through at that club because it wasn't that long ago we was in the same situation. I think the problem there is it, it tends to be from as an outsider looking in more to do with the ownership and that's that's an, an issue that the EFL are looking to address. We've got a big EFL meeting and the events at Berry is very much going to be centre stage. So we're going to have to find out how that, that pans out. You know, we've got, as a club, we've got our own opinions on that and we'll be voicing that at, at the relevant meetings. Um, in regards of the season ticket situation, i.e. should there be a refund 123rd of, of the games? Playing devil's advocate here, as I always try to do, you know, to get to, to a solution. There's an argument that all of our costs for the year are exactly the same effectively, so we still have to pay the players, pay the staff, and when you're working out your budget for the season based on season ticket and match day income, you're basing it on the 23 games. So as a club, we're down anyway because of the match day income that we would have, have got from that game. Is that the fault of the fans? No. Is it something that we're looking at? Yes. And subsequently, we've got a meeting with the Tony Goodall Fans Conference, which we'll be discussing it with them. I'm sure that we'll get to a solution that hopefully the fans and the club can both be happy with. So it's not just a simple case of taking the money off? Well, when you say taking the money off, you could... Listen, one of the scenarios we're looking at is you just refund the fans. You know, you, you obviously that's within our remit to do that. Um, I'm not seeing huge amounts of fans jumping up and down, demanding that at the moment, um, which is fair play to them. One, because we don't know what... The, the current, it's only last week we un, knew what was actually finally happening with Berry. There was still a hope they could continue. So it's still very much up until a week ago it was in the air. You know, we've had a lot of internal meetings. I've met, you know, we've, we've spoke about it in the office downstairs and what do people think? Um, I think we know what we, we the right thing to do. Um, but as I said, there is that nag as well that our expense, it's a big hit for a club because you've got 14 and a half thousand season ticket holders, you know, to refund specifically for that particular game. Um, one, it sets a precedent, and two, as I said, our, our expenses, salary costs, plow wages, you name it, doesn't go away for that week. So there's there's a bit of a balancing act to have, have there. But as I said, we, we do have the Tony Goodall fans repre representative group that represents all the supporters clubs. So we're going to judge a bit of feedback there and see what they think, obviously off the back of deciding what the FL do do finally with Berry. What action is the club taking with iFollow to ensure that embarrassment is not repeated? Also, can you encourage them to communicate much more proactively with fans when there is an issue? Yeah, two questions there. Obviously, we, we do encourage them to interact more with fans, especially when there is an issue. I think they were very quick, um, I believe, after the commentary game, which I think is the embarrassment issue that's being ref incident that's being referred to there. Um, they were very quick to come out straight away and say, look, we're just offering a, you know, a carte blanche refund to everyone. So I think they've taken that on board, did react quickly. The general standard from the feedback that I'm getting and, and the clips that I've seen, it has improved significantly this season. Replays, more stats on board, syncing up with the, comment the commentary and, and the actual play you know, the actual video. So all of that seems to be working a lot better. There are further improvements due during this season in regards to getting more cameras in, different camera angles. So we hope to see a steady improvement in, in the quality that's gone from where it was a couple of years ago, which was pretty poor. You know, the, even the commentary wasn't synced, the ball wasn't being followed properly by the cameraman, you know, it was pretty poor. That has improved, we want continued improvement, but the incident that, is being mentioned was just do, to do internally 
Um, there's about three different camera companies working on a match day that wasn't actually, to our knowledge, the eye follows thought that was something internal at the club that we've looked at, addressed, and, and you know, hopefully it will not happen again. Yeah, but we're aware of it. But we are aware of it, yeah. And that was where there was a blank out. Um, you know, the screens went blank, didn't they, for, I believe, for 20 minutes either side of uh, half-time. OK, on to the season. Why has this season been so poorly planned fixture-wise? And before blaming the EFL, why don't you put more pressure on them? Well, I don't think it was planned, was it? <laughs> I don't think it was poorly planned. I mean, the season was the season. Um, so very totally outside of our control, the Berry cancellation. We've tried to address that by bringing forward um, a leasing.com game in Norwich that's, that's being played now on that Saturday. Totally out of our hands. Um, the game this Saturday um, that was due to be against Southend United, you know, we've got injuries. Every club's got injuries, not making you know, any excuse there. On top of that, we had three of our starters that started the previous game were called up to international duty. So again, that caveat's there. I don't know of many teams or any teams that if three of their their players are called away on international duty, don't you know, take the option to call the game off. You want to go into every game with your strongest possible starting 11. Um, and all the championship games are off, you know, similarly because of it being international break weekend. So again, totally out of our control there, really, unless we wanted to play the game. We had a big debate about that. We desperately tried to get the game on and, and you know, do do the complete opposite of what other clubs do, which is normally just call the games off straight away. We tried to get it on. I had a set, myself and Kenny sat down and basically on the back of Marcus Harness being injured on top of five or six long-term injuries, plus three that were due to go on international duty, you looked at what was left there and it was pretty threadbare. So we just said, look, it's just a logical thing to do to, to call the game off. Yeah, and it could horribly backfire, couldn't it? It could have done. Um, Tuesday night here with everyone back from international duty, hopefully, you know, some people like recovering from injuries at that point, who knows, but same for the South End um, team as well. And, you know, just got to give yourself the best chance of success. And we felt, especially it wasn't just the fact of the long-term injuries or Marcus Harness, it was the fact of losing three starters from the previous league game and Marcus Harness as well. It's like near, nearly half your team or four players that including your goalkeeper that you're going to have to spin again you know, in, into to a game at, um, at a crucial time of the season where we, we're looking to get points and move up the table. So that, that, that was the decision why, why that was taken. The other one that was um, moved was Rotherham. I suppose, yes, you could level that at the EFL in that we did request pre-season as we do every year. Victorious weekend here in Portsmouth, very, very difficult for a number of operational reasons. That request for this season, don't ask me why wasn't adhered to, we made our um, views and opinions known on that very clear to the EFL, but by that time the, the, the fixture list is out and there's not very little you can do. So hopefully they'll learn, will learn, and, and that won't happen again in following seasons. Moving that on. the only one really you could level at the EFL in regards to putting pressure on them. You know, international duty and the Berry situation really is outside of everyone's control. Have, you known, football. have you known such a stuttering start to a season? No, like? not really, but I would say it's, it shows how well you're doing if you get an international call up. So, it, it, you know, please God, you know, you get more and more because that means we're doing very, very well as a club. OK, moving on. Can the club reconsider the ridiculous ban on bringing in fast food from outside the ground? The ban doesn't make sense and harms match day experience. Well, make some sense of it then. Well, I'll make some sense of it. A um, number of issues. We A couple of um, problems we had earlier on in the season was people bringing in their own drinks, Coke bottles, um, people causing trouble in the ground and subsequently found that the drinks they'd been bringing in as, as Coca-Cola actually had vodka in it. So one instance there, massive clean-up operation after games, state of the stadium, you know, big costs involved in cleaning up after you know, McDonald's, Kentucky Fried Chicken, Subway, you name it, wrappers all over the place. Secondly, thirdly, we're, we're looking to make investments and we've already started that. You can see it in the Fratton end this year in our kiosk, working closer with our catering partner, Centreplate. And, you know, you have to maximise 
that revenue. So we can't be allowing people. I don't know any other sporting event where you can bring, you know, takeaways from everywhere else in. Maybe there is, maybe there are instances, but I'm just saying this is the route we're gonna go. So all we're asking is people, if you, if you buy a McDonald's, buy a Subway, KFC, great, but can you please eat it outside the stadium? If you come into our stadium, we want to buy your food and drink from us internally. Yeah, not just sporting events, cinemas, theatres, anywhere. Yeah, you can't turn up at your cinema and with your McDonald's and walk through. Not that I'm aware of, but you know, I wouldn't think you would be allowed. And there's not many clubs I know that do allow you to bring in, um, you know, food from from an external company. Um, but as I say, in, it, it's, it's uh, we always say this. Unfortunately, the minority spoil it for the majority. But as you know, there was some quite serious incidents early doors in the season that people were, you know sneaking in drinks in coca-cola that had alcohol in it and would sit there drinking getting drunk and then causing a disturbance to people around them and then that leads to a further incident but that was listen that wasn't the main issue i have to to be honest the the biggest issue is that it, it's the big cleanup operation after the game from you know people bringing external and the per head spend internally from the company that we use compared to all the other stadiums that don't uh, doesn't allow um, outside food to be brought in was so much higher at the other clubs and you know we're in danger of losing that contract we didn't want to lose it we're going to make investments on going into our um, kiosks so it was important that we maximize revenue on a match day so there you are there's the sense yeah yeah and, it, and again it's it's a matter of opinion some people are going to see that and others are going to go crazy about it but there's as I'm sure we're going to come on to later on about the questions with Kenny Jacket. It is all about opinions. Yeah. Okay. What's the reasoning behind removing the bookies from the South Stand? Well, as you know, there was a lot of work went on um, in the South Stand, specifically if we're just dealing with the South Stand during the summer. The whole of the back was taken, new roof, taken out, new roof. Um, and we took the time to have a big clean up, create some more space. Most people now tend to, to you know, do bets and whatever online. Um, the physical place there that was taking the bets, you know, we just took the opportunity to have a big clear out. Hopefully it's gonna create some more space that we can put back to the previous question, some more catering facilities there, you know, during the season. Uh, onto restricted view seats. Number of them at Thratton Park that cost exactly the same amount as a standard match ticket. Surely these need to see a reduction in price. Well, they could do, but then you're going to have to put other prices up. You know, we've got a budget for for the season in in regards of um, revenue generated by either season tickets or match day revenue. If we start cutting the price for restricted view in some, then there's the argument. Yeah, but you've got a brilliant seat there, and we up that price again. We've discussed this previously with the Tony Goodall fans conference, and the one price um, fits all seems to work. You know, if people want to open that debate again, I'm more than happy with our team to, to have a look at it. But as I say, if, if you cut there, you have to up somewhere else. You just can't cut, cut. Just another setback for having an ancient ground. It is. Um, and the policy seems to be working. We attracted, we had to put a cap on season ticket holders this year. Um, and, and the match day demand just keeps going up and up and up. So I, I don't, but that's not saying people should accept the fact that, you know, they've got a restricted view, but there are restricted views at a number of stadiums. Um, but the way our current financial model works, if we was to start cutting two, three hundred, we'd have to look to maximise that revenue elsewhere. All right. Have the owners made any investment in the academy or is it still funded by the Pompey Lottery? If they have invested, to what level as a percentage of overall academy revenues? Well... When, when, when you're talking about investment, Michael doesn't invest in specific areas. His money goes into the club and then us as an executive decides where that money is then spent within the club. So previously, and that was the same under, you know, fan community ownership, where we, we had a budget for the academy. Um, that budget was always, I mean, it's very expensive to run an academy, but you do get funding in centrally from the EFL. And we have schemes as well, like the lottery, that, that helps that by going into to the um, academy. However, there is a significant shortfall that has always been historically picked up by the, the club. 
that continues to be the case. So in answer, the lottery doesn't cover the shortfall. You know, it still costs the club um, financially to run the academy. Um, and all I can say that the investment in the academy as a whole continues to rise year on year. OK. The Our Club documentary, tremendous success. I haven't heard a bad word about it. Is it likely to be released on DVD? It's something we met with Ian Sylvester and Colin Farmery. You know, have been driving this project forward. Um, you know, we've done all that we can to, to help them do that. One of the things we talked about was DVDs, um, and it was something that they were looking at and something that if they do produce a DVD, which we're, we're hopeful they will, because myself and Anna Mitchell, the Chief Commercial Officer, discussed it when we think it would be something because of the demographic of the fans that will we think buy into to the documentary, um, maybe more in the DVD um, demographic than downloading or streaming online. So especially with Christmas coming up as well, it could make a good gift. So it is something that we're currently discussing with Ian and Colin. And as you will agree, it's deserving of a much wider audience. It's, it's topical even now. It is topical with everything that's gone on at Berry and Bolton and, and you know, the, the struggles that we have. I think there was a desire um, from Colin from the start not to make this too much Pompey centric and it was just more of a story of what can happen to football clubs you know if, if they're mismanaged. Are there any plans to release more retro Pompey shirts? I believe there are yeah that's the answer to that yeah I, can't, I don't know when or, or what type but I know that the retro shirts have been popular and it's something that as a club we are pushing with our retail partners to, to get more of them out there. OK, that's all out of the way. Let's, let's get on to the nitty-gritty. Spicy uh, stuff. <laughs> an update on Kenny Jackett's future. Do, do we need one? Uh, personally, I don't, I don't believe we do. Um, it seems to be a hot topic out there amongst social media at the moment. But if, if there's questions on it, I'm more than happy to head them front on. We spoke to Michael Eisner about a month ago, and he was unequivocal in his support, long-term support, for the manager. One assumes that's not changed. I've, I, honestly, I've not had one discussion with Michael about the future of Kenny, genuinely. I don't even know how it's even on the radar for, for a number of reasons. So I don't know I hope if there's more questions, I'm not cutting across various questions here. But if you go back to Michael's speech at the Guild Hall, um, I have this thing at the moment with politicians. Politicians have lost credibility. Why? Because they say one thing one month and then do the opposite a month later. So people don't know what to believe or not to believe anymore. When Michael stood up two years plus ago now at the Guildhall, he said we would run the club self-sustainably. Um, there wouldn't be crazy money thrown, you know, at the playing side. He would invest heavily, which he's doing, off the pitch. But if you want, if you want a crazy owner that's going to come in and get the club back into financial difficulty, and you want them to start throwing money on the pitch willy-nilly at players that's not sustainable, don't vote for me to, to take over the football club, OK? Now, in that regard, 100%, he has stuck to his word. Another key point of what he said was, I'm not going to be a chairman or employ a management team that sacks their managers willy-nilly. You know, we get a manager in, we support him, we give him a contract, we expect that contract to be honoured, and we will stick by our manager through thick and thin. We want stability consistently across our management structure. Now, on the back of effectively two losses, people, you know, on social media seem to be, you know, having wanting us to review Kenny Jackett's future. Now, that is their opinion, but and they're entitled to an opinion. But our opinion is we're going to stay true to our word. We're very, very. If you look at Kenny's record, and people talk. As, as we know on social media, yeah, I have to deal in facts. And the facts are that, and this is, and, and actually this was a supporter who said he can't understand why Kenny's even being debated at the moment, and I can't, yeah? And he said, you do, have a look at Wikipedia. In terms of win percentage, since, oh, what, I forget the manager's name, but it was in 1904, Kenny has the highest win percentage of any manager we've had. What's that, 115 years? Yeah, we fin he finished eighth in his first year, he finished fourth in his second, arguably lost two of our best players this year. We're in the middle of rebuilding the team. Yeah, it's the first few games, and we have lost a couple. You know, 
can't, that's a fact as well. But is he anywhere near a spectrum of being even under review? No. So I just want to make that clear. And I, and I, you know, we've talked about this. I think there's a disconnect because on a match day and the, the emails and such like that I get, you know, it's very like, don't listen to people on social media, very small minority and whatever. So I think all clubs or any business, you have to be careful. We're not letting the, the towel wag the dog. Yeah. And as I say, it's we've on the back of as well, 14 and a half thousand season tickets, we had to put a cap on it, selling out for almost every game, you know, commercially, corporate hospitality, everything's going up and up and up. So if people are being are dissatisfied, we're not seeing it as a business. And all I can deal dealing is the facts and, and they're the facts there. So I probably have answered about 10 questions in one there. <laughs> well, then what would it take for his job to be under threat? It's the same as anyone. Every, like I'm under constant review and probably on the back of this, you know, people are going to say I should be under even more review. But I'm just giving you the, the facts of the win statistics, the win statistics, the financial statistics of the demand at Fratton Park for games. I mean, the leasing.com the other night, 3,700. I, I think there's probably, since it went, changed the new format and there was the boycott, I think that was the highest Fratton Park attendance. You know, I could be wrong, but... I believe it was start of last year was only getting it was getting less than two thousand. So we're not seeing as as a club in how the business is being run any disconnect with the fan base and, and Kenny, other than what I'm reading on social media. Weren't we in this situation with Paul Cook a couple of months before he won? Well, yeah, the that's league? the point. The, the same people that I'm reading now that, that want Kenny out, not all of them, because it's getting back to opinions, but on the back of eight or nine games to go, on the back of a 1-0 loss here to Crewe, honestly, that what you're seeing now with Kenny, multiply it by, like, 20. And that was the vitriol to get Paul Cook out at that point. And we didn't. And what happened? We went on, nothing to do with promoted. We went, we went and run the league, won the league. And ironically, when Paul left, the same people that wanted him sacked were calling him a snake for going to another job. So it goes back to what I've said only before. You've got to have... Like, law is a two-way street. And, again, back to how we run as a football club under Michael Eisner's chairmanship is we give out contracts, we fully expect to honour our contracts with the employees, and we expect employees to honour con the contracts with us. And this is why we got frustrated over the summer with certain players wanting to leave and break their contract. We're not in the habit of breaking contracts. When these questions came up, I saw some comments saying how they're going to dodge these bullets. People that watch this regularly should know we don't. No, we never never do, do we? I don't think... Because there's no point in sitting here not answering. That What's the point? It's the, it is a topical subject, but it's a topical subject on social media. Yeah, we're a club that has and will continue to be run on some clear, defining principles. Loyalty, consistency, hard work, stability all built around long-term vision and thinking. We're not going to be, you know, there's going to be bumps in the road all the way along that. We know that, you know, that happens. It's football. It's a very volatile business to be in. But we remain steadfast in how we want to run this club. And not being funny, not how we want to run it, how we are going to run it. Thanks for your honesty as always. All right, thank you, Johnny.